Well, good evening, everybody. I want to welcome you to the President's Lecture Series, the first of this year. We're glad you're here. In this uh, semester of COVID, we have some who are joining us in person, and we have many who are joining us online. My name is Don Sweeting, President of Colorado Christian University, and it's a, a, a joy to be part of an academic community like this with uh, brilliant, gifted professors and teachers and students who are ready to learn. Uh, we have this series that goes throughout the year. The, the guests who come and speak to us come from all different backgrounds. And sometimes we have our own profs come and step up and speak to us as well. On January 9th of this year, WHO announced there was a mysterious coronavirus related pneumonia in Wuhan, China. And at that point, the World Health Organization still had doubts about the roots of what would become known as COVID-19. On March 11th, 2020, the novel disease was declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. On March 13th, a national emergency was declared in the United States concerning the COVID-19 outbreak. From January to June, the coronavirus disease evolved from an isolated disease in a region of China to a global pandemic that brought countries to a standstill, pushed hospital systems to the brink, and dragged the global economy towards a recession. The world had become a very different place in a short period of time. COVID-19 had become the fifth documented pandemic since the 1918 flu pandemic. Most of us were caught off guard by this. But now, nine months later, we're beginning to see life on the other side of this. What have we learned? What do we know about the nature of pandemics? To answer that question, I've asked Dr. Mark Parker to speak to us this evening for our first lecture, who has expertise in this subject. Dr. Parker's initial training was in microbiology. From there, he trained as a developmental biologist and neuroscientist in preparation for working in academic research, where he studied the molecular mechanisms guiding the transmissibility of viral infections of the nervous system. He received his BS in microbiology from Indiana University, his MA in theology from Colorado Christian University, his PhD in biological sciences from the University of Denver. He did postdoctoral work, a postdoctoral fellowship in developmental neuroscience at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's also a fellow of the American Scientific Affiliation. He also spent several years in the biotech industry where he directed research and development programs. He's always had a passion for teaching and was blessed to join the CCU faculty in 2011, where he now serves as full professor and founding dean of our School of Science and Engineering. We're glad to have Dr. Parker with us. I'm gonna open in prayer before we begin. Uh, so let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing on tonight. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day of, of grace, for all your good gifts. Thank you for health, for the human body, uh, for uh, all the mechanisms that you created in us. Thank you for science. Thank you for frontline workers who work on uh, epidemics and vaccines. We pray your blessing upon them tonight, and we thank you for those in our midst who are teachers to help us understand these things. So uh, bless us as we think about this very important topic. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So would you please welcome Dr. Mark Park. Thank you, Dr. Sweeting, for that warm welcome. Um, in this day and age, now we have the ceremonial doffing of our mask, apparently. Um, hopefully you can hear me just fine without it. Should be better. So in January, our world changed. And for many of us, a new word was introduced in our vocabulary. So I went on Google News just out of curiosity yesterday, and there was about between 40 and 50 news stories. And there were nearly 30 recommend, uh, references to pandemic, epidemic, COVID-19, coronavirus. And these are all words that probably weren't in your vocabulary when you were home for Christmas break or when you were on a mission trip in the fall or whenever. But since then, our world has changed and they've become part of our vernacular. But for most of us, those words 
still, while they resonate and are common, don't necessarily mean that much to us. They're terms that we throw around. They're terms that affect every aspect of our new existence. But what actually is a pandemic and where did it come from? Why do they happen? So my goal tonight is to give you a little bit of context, a little basis for understanding exactly what a pandemic is and why and how they happen. So, <clears throat> excuse me. What a pandemic is, is just an increased instance of, of an infectious disease. So most of what we're going to be talking about tonight deals with just that, infectious diseases. So I'm gonna give some context for the history of pandemics. I'm gonna discuss the factors that lead to pandemics and contribute to pandemics. Look at the traits of the organisms that lead to pandemics and cause pandemics. And then I'm also gonna talk briefly about not only the current situation, but future threats as well. There are brilliant people all over the world who spend their lives looking for that next big threat. So it just so happens this one blindsided us a little bit, but we're well equipped to think about what's coming next. Okay, so we're talking about infectious disease. What does that actually mean? Well, an infectious disease is when a pathogen causes disease in humans that's transmissible in some fashion from person to person, either directly or through some other vector. So you've heard of all sorts of different diseases that can be spread person to person, the common cold, influenza, direct infection. And then there are other infectious diseases that rely on a vector. Something like West Nile that's appeared in the US in the last few years is spread by insect vectors, right? So the transmission isn't person to person, but rather relies on a vector. And so we'll talk about how these different parts of disease transmission play into pandemics and how they affect our everyday world, okay? So my goal here is just to provide you some background, some context, and some understanding to put our new world into perspective. So when we talk about infectious disease, what we have to consider is that there are diseases that are always with us. I just mentioned the common cold. Okay, the common cold would be considered endemic, right? An endemic disease is something that's always present to a greater or lesser extent for some example, right? So we all know that the common cold is around and it circulates. We typically tend to think of it occurring more in the winter during cold weather, that sort of thing, but it's always here in the population. So it's endemic, if you will. And did you know that one of the common, the causes of the common cold is actually some coronaviruses that already existed? So prior to about 2000, the only known disease causing coronaviruses in humans were actually really mild upper respiratory infections, similar to your everyday common cold, usually not even diagnosed as a coronavirus infection. So coronaviruses are not new to humankind, but the fact that they're causing severe diseases like SARS in the early 2000s, MERS a few years later, and now the COVID-19 kind of came as a surprise. Okay, so endemic disease, exists at low levels throughout the population and, it all, and is always present. It's going to circulate, it's going to change, it's going to be there. But every once in a while, you get a jump. So a localized outbreak that then ramps up beyond the normal endemic levels. And this is what we refer to it as an epidemic if it's broad spread. Now, if you have only a local outbreak possibly restricted to something like a school. So occasionally you'll hear about a school or a military break, uh, barracks or something like that, having an outbreak of an infectious disease, like say meningitis or something like that, that requires close quarters for transmission. That would be considered an outbreak, not an epidemic. The levels have increased beyond normal endemic levels. So there's been an, an increase in the incidence, but it's localized, right? So you get localized outbreaks of disease, but it's only when those outbreaks, outbreaks then spread beyond normal geographic boundaries, beyond a limited range, that it's considered an epidemic. 
So periodically, we have outbreaks of epidemic disease in the United States. They're more rare now than they've been in the past, but epidemics typically happen. And until the 1950s, epidemics were relatively common. It was a common feature of life in the United States to have outbreaks that ramped up into epidemics. Increased instances of infectious disease well beyond the normal background that led to severe consequences. So until the middle of the 1900s, it was quite common to have measles outbreaks, mumps, rubella, polio, various pneumonias, hepatitis. So lots of different localized outbreaks. Our localized outbreaks could turn into these epidemics. Okay? So it's these epidemics that we watch for to see if they can spread beyond there. Okay? And when epidemics arise, there are mechanisms in place to track the incidence of those diseases. So certain diseases are reportable diseases to your public health departments, and they're monitored. Oh, we've got some influenza popping up here above normal background levels, and there's some influenza popping up here above background levels, and those are monitored for the incidence or, or that, that flip over where it spreads geographically and can turn into an epidemic. Okay. So, Epidemics typically in modern times are restricted to a few infectious diseases, largely due to uh, public health campaigns that have focused strongly on vaccination to provide immunity within the population to prevent the spread of those diseases. So when you consider a disease like measles, it is so highly infectious that it's possible for someone with an active case of measles to walk through this room and everybody who is not immunized to catch that disease hours later walking through the same room, okay? It's one of the most incredibly transmissible diseases we know. There's a measure that's used by epidemiologists, sometimes referred to as R0, so R sub zero, and it refers to the number of other individuals that an infected patient will spread the disease to. So R0 of measles has been estimated anywhere from 15 to 35, meaning that one in affected individual typically infects between a dozen and 35 other individuals, okay? But if we have a robust immunization program where everybody that individual encounters is immune thanks to a childhood vaccination, the spread of the disease stops, okay? So Epidemics in the United States have largely been controlled through these robust public health programs, okay? And there's a long history of using these techniques. So one of the earliest forms of vaccination, immunization, that sort of thing, is a technique called variolation. So smallpox used to be one of the single most gruesome diseases in mankind. The death toll was extraordinarily, extraordinary. Millions of people died every year from smallpox. Beginning, we estimate in the 14 or 1500s, in various parts of the world, it was discovered that if you took an infectious pustule, so smallpox causes these terrible sores that actually produce pus, if you took a scraping from one of those pustules, and scraped the skin of an uninfected individual, it would give them a very mild case of the disease, and then after that, they would be immune. And so this technique was called variolation. It was used in China, it was used in India, it was used in Africa at various times. And by the uh, 1700s, it had spread to Europe, largely along the trade routes, because some of that information was moving back and forth. We typically don't think about that, but as early as the 1700s, 1700s, there was pretty robust global travel going on. It took a little slower than, or it took a little more time than it does today. It was much slower, but information traveled, including this technique of variolation. So by the 1700s, Europeans were beginning to self-inoculate for smallpox, and it greatly decreased the death rates. So in the early, in the mid 1700s, here in the United States, there was a campaign to do this, and one of the first statistical analysis of 
these immunization campaign, campaigns were done. And it showed that the mortality rate for the uninoculated was between 15 and 20 percent. But for those who had been treated with this variolation technique, the mortality rate dropped to about 2 percent. So some people did get sick. Some people got too large of a dose. They got really sick and then could die. But for many, it provided protection. And then from there, in the late 1700s, Edward Jenner discovered that milkmaids, women who for a living milk cows, sometimes got exposed to a disease called cowpox, which produced similar pustules on the udders of the cows they were milking. They would then get that transferred to their hands and they'd get these pustules on their hands. But it turned out that milkmaids didn't get sick in a smallpox, epi smallpox epidemic. And so some people prior to Jenner had postulated this as well, but Jenner's the one that sort of acted on it and published it. He took, instead of a smallpox victim and scraping their sores and passing it on and passing it on, what he did was he took the pustules from a milkmaid who had active cowpox on her hands and used it to inoculate a young boy. Now here's we, where we get into the difference between modern clinical trials and early experimental medicine. So this was 1796. So Jenner inoculated this eight-year-old boy. It was the son of the guy who did his gardening and landscaping for him. Don't know how that deal worked out, but anyway. Uh, Jenner took and inoculated this young man with material taken from a young lady's active cowpox infection. And then he waited about six weeks and then decided, let's see if it worked. So he found someone who had active smallpox, took the smallpox from that individual, and then injected it into this young boy. Fortunately, it was a success, and the young boy did not get ill, let alone die from smallpox. So first really well-documented case. He went on to do this multiple other times, and it was published, and became sort of the first, Jenner's considered sort of the founder of vaccination. So I don't recommend experimental medicine uh, in this fashion, but in the past it has served uh, a use. About 100 years later, uh, Pasteur was studying, among other things, rabies. And it turned out that a young boy in the town where he lived was attacked by a rabid dog and severely injured. Now, rabies is one of the single most dangerous infections known to mankind. Without treatment, rabies is 100% lethal. If you are infected with rabies, you die. To my knowledge, there's been one historical case ever documented where someone had an active rabies infection and survived without treatment. One. This is one of the worst things we know. Okay? This young boy was attacked by the rabid dog, and his mother was distraught because she know within, knew within a few weeks he'd become rabid and die. Jenner had been experimenting, or I'm sorry, Pasteur had been experimenting with deriving the virus from rabid animals and then removing their central nervous system. Rabies is a central nervous infection. And then drying that tissue until it became uninfected, where when it was injected into another animal, it wouldn't cause disease. And so we discovered that by drying the spinal cord of a rabid animal and waiting about two weeks, he could inject that material back, the animal wouldn't get the disease. And so his hope was that there was enough viral particles, even though he had no idea what a virus was in uh, uh, 1885, he hoped that whatever was causing the disease would be sufficient to help the boy fight it off, but not cause the disease. So over a series of a uh, few weeks, he inoculated this young man multiple times, with this dried spinal cord preparation and was able to save the boy's life. He never developed an active rabies infection. And from there, we've developed the techniques for producing rabies treatments that have been life-saving. So we still use a series of injections and it's still able to pre prevent uh, active infection of one of the most dangerous viruses known to man. So we've got a long history of doing this. In the 1950s, Polio was a common epidemic. I'm sure some of you know who Franklin Delano Roosevelt was, our president. 
Well, it turns out uh, as a young adult, FDR was actually infected with polio. It used to be that polio was a common epidemic occurrence in the United States, especially during the summer. And 1952 is one of the worst years for polio with over 50,000 cases. Polio results in uh, muscular paralysis many times. 20,000 of those cases resulted in significant paralysis. This was a big public health issue. Okay. Jonas Salk at the time was able to culture various strains of the polio vi virus, inactivate them, and then use that as a vaccination to elicit an immune response, which then made the individual who had been inoculated immune to future polio infection. And so at the peak of this infection, parents were very, very willing to use a risky new vaccine because they didn't want their children to potentially become paralyzed because they saw every neighborhood had a child who had been infected and become paralyzed. So uh, Salk not only developed this vac vaccine, but he injected into it himself, his wife, and his own children. And then he got parents around the country to volunteer to sign up their elementary age children to be infect injected with this experimental vaccine. And it turned out to be a wonderful success preventing polio. And by now, polio is pretty much eradicated in most of developed countries, thanks to initially this vaccine and then a subsequent vaccine, which is easier to administer. The interesting footnote on Salk's polio vaccine is that in the rush to manufacture it to help stem this epidemic, there was a manufacturer who let a bad batch slip through. And instead of having killed virus in their inoculums, they actually had some live virus and 11 children died from the vaccination. Several hundred more were paralyzed. But the interesting thing is that parents felt the polio was such a grave threat that there was no decrease in immunization rates for the polio vaccine at that time. They continued to immunize their children because on balance, they felt that the risk was more than worth it. So we can go on and on talking about how these vaccines have developed, but I wanna highlight one specific individual and we'll come back to his contributions later as well. But there was a gentleman from Montana named Maurice Heilman who worked to develop some of the earliest vaccines. So one of the early childhood diseases that in some children causes sort of moderate infection, but other can have, and others can have grave consequences is mumps. Heilman had worked to develop vaccines and antitoxins and different treatments over the years. And one morning his daughter woke him up and she came in and she had these massive bumps on the side of her face. Well, it turns out that the mumps virus infects your parotid glands, the salivary glands that are right here and give you this characteristic chipmunk appearance. So Heilman, being the experimental scientist that he was, told his little daughter, here, you lay down and get comfortable, I'll be right back. He drove to the lab, got some culture media, got some sterile swabs, came home, swabbed the back of her throat to get a virus culture, drove back to the lab, cultured the virus, and developed the first mumps vaccine. And the vaccine that we still use today is based on some of his experiments. And there's a wonderful picture I didn't put it in my slides, but the young lady's name was Jerry Lynn. And the, one of the vaccines still carries that initials or that name, the Gerald Lynn vaccine. There's a wonderful picture of Gerald Lynn a few years later after the vaccine had been commercialized, sitting with her little sister, looking on with a smile as her little sister is being inoculated, jabbed with a needle. The little sister just screaming her head off and Gerald Lynn's just smiling away. It's quite amusing. Anyway. Heilman is responsible. He felt it his calling to try and eliminate diseases that cause death in children. It was his passion. And so it turns out that he's responsible for developing vaccines, not only to mumps, but to measles, rubella, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, the most common form of meningitis, one of the most common forms of pneumonia, and on and on and on. So, it's 
through the efforts of researchers like this that we're able to control many of the epidemics that have plagued mankind throughout history. Okay? So an epidemic, again, is this sudden ramp up of typically an endemic disease beyond normal levels. Okay? But how does an epidemic jump to become a pandemic? Okay? So a pandemic is when an epidemic expands across international borders, affects a much larger number of people, so that you have this radical change in isolated outbreaks, normal endemic disease, a localized epidemic that may spread, to all of a sudden an epidemic that has spilled across international boundaries and affected large numbers of people throughout the world. Now, you may be familiar with the common distribution of in influenza. So seasonal influenza kind of migrates, okay? During the winter here in the Northern Hemisphere is our flu season. It's starting right now. If you haven't had your flu shot, I highly advise it. It begins now, ramps up through the winter and then declines. Well, the flu doesn't just go away, it moves around the globe. So high levels of flu incidence in the northern hemisphere during our winter, high levels in the southern hemisphere during their winter, during our summer. It just sort of migrates around the globe, crosses international borders, but it's not considered a pandemic because that's the normal seasonal distribution of the disease. Does that make sense? Now, every once in a while, you get things that jump up beyond the normal. So historically, there have been a number of major pandemics, and I want to talk through them a little bit to help give you an idea of more what we're talking about here. So on this chart, I've listed some of the historic pandemics that occurred, and we're going to start at the bottom and talk a little bit about the Russian flu that erupted in 1889. So many people consider this the first global pandemic. First cases were reported in St. Petersburg, Russia, and in a mere six weeks later, they'd reached the UK and Western Europe. Pretty well documented. And you have to realize we don't know exactly what the causative agent was, what the pathogen was, because at this time, people didn't know about viruses. There was no public health system that required reporting of certain infectious diseases. We pieced this together from newspaper reports and historical accounts and so on. But the levels of the disease were unprecedented worldwide. Okay? And it moved very, very rapidly. So like I said, it was able to move from Russia to the UK in a mere six weeks. Now some people will say, this is an excellent case study in the effect that, uh, in the um, effect that doing things like limiting air travel has on the spread of disease. In 1889, there was no air travel. You were not getting on a plane in China and flying directly to the US, stopping at major airports along the way, spreading the disease. Rather, you were taking trains and sta stage coaches and sailing ships, and yet it was able to distribute without, throughout Europe in a matter of weeks. Death tolls are only approximate, like I said, pieced together from historical records. But it appears that we're talking around a million deaths worldwide in the 1880s, or late 1880s, early, late, early 1890s attributed directly to this disease. The interesting thing about the Russian flu is because we don't have specific identification of the causative agents, it's believed to be one of the influences with an h 3N8 antigen type. There have been some papers published stating that the coronavirus that I mentioned that causes mild flu or mild cold like symptoms first moved from their animal reservoir, which was cattle, to humans somewhat, sometime during this period as well. So there have been some speculation that this could have been a coronavirus pandemic. There's very little scientific evidence to support that. But it's an interesting theory, especially in light of what's happening now in 
2019 and 2020. Okay. The first really devastating global pandemic was sometimes termed the, termed the Spanish flu, but it was the 1918-1920 influenza. So a new antigen type, and let me explain briefly what these letters mean here. So you'll see where I have influenza. I have them labeled as influenza A, and then I have an H and a number and an N and a number. That refers to two markers that occur on the surface of these viruses, okay? They're markers that the virus uses on their surface to help get into your body to cause infection, and they're little tags that your body uses to identify themselves as something that doesn't belong in your body that you should attack. The way your in immune system works, and the reason these inoculations and vaccine programs that I've talked about work is because if you're ever challenged with something that doesn't belong in your body, like a virus, your body looks at it, says it doesn't belong, gets rid of it, but remembers. So that if it ever sees it again, it will be able to mount a massive immune response and clear it before you ever get sick. So the reason that uh, the little boy inoculated with cowpox didn't get smallpox when he was injected with it was because cowpox is close enough to smallpox that his body saw it and remembered this is bad and we got to go crazy to get rid of it. Okay? Same thing with the rabies. Before the rabies vaccine could take hold in the young man attacked by the dog, his immune system remembered seeing these pieces of spinal cord that had been infected with this terrible rabies virus mounted an immune response to it, and then were able to fight off the virus before it caused disease. Okay? So this H1, N1, H3, N2, those are the markers on the virus. And they're important to note because these viruses are sort of cyclic in their ability to cause pandemics. So everybody who either was inoculated with uh, an um, uh, vaccination against that specific isotype or who was sick with that specific isotype won't get it again. So typically what happens is you only get a pandemic when a new version arises. So 1918 was especially devastating because this N1, H1N1 was not present in the population before that. Influenza was moving around the world in a seasonal cycle, just like it always has, but not an H1N1. Nobody had seen H1N1. And so when it popped up, nobody was immune to it. Okay. So this 1918 flu pandemic is the worst pandemic in recorded history. Okay. Many things contributed to its severity a brand new antigenic isotype, which had never been identified before, a unique set of circumstances surrounding World War I and some of the first mass movements of humans around the globe in short order. So World War I was causing the movement of troops all over the world, and those troops were kept in close proximity for long periods of time. And there are lots of terrible and tragic stories about things like a troop ship that would leave full of healthy troops that would dock on the other side of the Atlantic a few weeks later, and it was a death ship. Many, 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 on a giant percentage of people were either unbelievably ill or had succumbed to the disease because it ran its course so quickly. In fact, this specific virus was so bad that there were reports of people going to bed healthy and dying in the course of their sleep. There's an anecdotal story of a physician who got on a streetcar in Johannesburg, South Africa for a five mile trip to his home and he reported three people dying on the streetcar before he reached his destination because they were initially symptomatic and then the disease progressed so rapidly that they died on the streetcar. He claims that he got off the streetcar before he reached his destination, and I can't say I would blame him. So this was the most devastating pandemic in recorded history. Estimates are 
that 50 million people died worldwide. In the United States, the effects were so severe and so many died that the average lifespan in the US dropped by 10 years. That's how many people died. At one point, estimates were that 50% of the people in the world had contracted this specific virus and between 50 and 200 million died. Absolutely devastating. Unique set of circumstances. We had World War I, we had global travel, we had all the disruption that resulted from World War I. And you'll notice that there are these jumps in time. The next major flu pandemic was sometimes termed, termed the Asian flu. So it occurred in 1957. You may remember I mentioned Heilman who did all this wonderful vaccine work. Turns out he was working at Walter Reed, which is the, at the time it was the Walter Reed Army Hospital. It's the sort of clearinghouse for uh, medical care of the United States military. He read about a flu outbreak in Hong Kong. And so he got on the phone to staff, medical, army medical staff in Japan and said, I need you to find me somebody that's sick. So they waited for a ship that was coming from Hong Kong that had reported a flu outbreak. One of the um, corpsmen went to the sickest guy he could find, gave him a bottle of salt water, had him gargle in it, spit it back in, they capped it up, they mailed it to Heilman in the United States, and he was able to culture flu virus right there from the sample from across the world. And what he discovered was that the existing flu vaccine, or I'm sorry, the existing flu virus was this H1N1 that had been around since 1918 and everybody had seen the H1N1 and so they were immune. But all of a sudden, this new flu that was progressing very rapidly and making people very ill had a new type. It was H2N2. And nobody that he tested carried antibodies to the H2N2. Nobody had ever seen it before. The only people he could find that had any immunity to it were people older than 65 years old. So it had been in the population in previous generations. So he was able to help develop some antibodies, but it was still a devastating global pandemic, resulting in the deaths of predicted up to 2 million people. And a few years later, there's another antigenic, antigenic shift in 1968, an H3N2 emerged. Again, a global pandemic spreading throughout the world, killing millions. Some of you may be old enough to remember the swine flu scare from about 2009. So the swine flu, we're back to H1N1. It's got some tweaks, but broadly it's H1N1. Nobody carries antibodies to H1N1 because it hasn't been around as that circulating flu virus for a century, right? The last time H1N1 was the major flu type was the early 1900s. So it sort of drifted out of the population. The uh, swine flu originated apparently in Mexico and was a unique recombination event of three different types of viruses that again spread quite rapidly throughout the world and resulted in the death of about half a million people. The interesting thing is now that we understand what's going on, when we identify some of these pathogens, we're able to head it off. So if you find a farm with uh, hogs that carry a unique infection, you're able to quarantine it. Sometimes they'll slaughter the hogs and they're able to stop the infection before they make the jump into people. And I'm gonna talk more about that in a minute. But one of the things that drives these epidemics is what we call zoonotic transmission. Each of these events that I've talked about so far started with an animal, the virus transmitted to humans, and then was able to pass freely back and forth between people, leading to its spread. Okay, so we're seeing some common features with these diseases. These are all influenzas. Everybody expected the next major pandemic to be influenza. There were a few people that have been watching for coronaviruses because like I mentioned, we had SARS in the early 2000s. We had MERS a few years later. Those are both diseases caused by coronavirus that were very, very severe. So SARS has a mortality rate of about 
So 15 out of 100 who get it are going to succumb to the infection. MERS is much worse. It's upwards of 50%. It's a very deadly disease, but it doesn't transmit well. There's very little person-to-person -person transmission in MERS. You basically have to be in direct contact with an infected camel or other reservoir for a period of time. Probably not going to cause a global pandemic. SARS, more transmissible, but you know they got a handle on it and only killed a few thousand. So they thought, okay, coronaviruses are nasty, but probably not a big deal. And then in 2019, a new coronavirus emerged that not only is pretty deadly, but it also transmits well between people. Okay? So what we're seeing is that these diseases have some common features. They're going to spread across, across the population, often in waves. They usually have origins in animals. They usually are something new that people who are around now have not seen. They don't have an immunity to. So it's this perfect storm that allows for their rapid spread. So there are other major, major events that have occurred in history. Um, the Black Death, the other plagues resulted in the death of estimated hundreds of millions, wiped out the population of Europe over time. Smallpox, like I mentioned, was this devastating, reoccurring disease that over history has killed hundreds of millions. These numbers are just predictions. We don't actually know. The thing is, we have control of these. Black Death is a bacterial infection, and we can treat it with antibiotics. Um, the plague, the virus is called Yersinia pestis. If you see the little groundhogs running around Colorado and peeping at you from their little holes, uh, don't go pet them. They have fleas, and the fleas carry Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of plague. Every year, there's a couple places cases of plague in Colorado. Uh, somebody plays with a dead prairie dog. Well, the prairie dog died of plague, and you just got it. Congratulations. Fortunately, easily treatable. Right? Uh, smallpox. Smallpox has been eradicated in the, wor in the world. There are no known cases of smallpox. The last wild case of smallpox, as it were, was 1977 in Somalia. Okay. It doesn't exist as an infection anymore. Unfortunately, the United States Army and the Russian Army have kept some around just in case. We won't get into the ethics of that. So it still exists, but not in the wild. So um, a little bit different. So what do these pandemics share in common? Well, one of the things that we want to look at is this perfect storm that has to occur, right? So when you talk about like an influenza virus or a coronavirus, that's your agent. That agent resides in a host and or infects a host. And the host is exposed to the agent given a particular environment. So without a laser pointer here, um, I can try to point to the screen, but it doesn't really work. Imagine placing yourself in the middle of that triangle. You're at the perfect nexus to be the host, be in an environment that contains the agent, and thus you get disease. So anything we can do to shift the balance of this epidemiological triangle, as it's called, allows us to modify disease transition rates. Okay? And depending on the situation, different things carry different weight. So you can imagine, you know, an example is we've got the CCU pond out here, right? So let's say the CCU pond was stocked with, I don't know, man-eating saltwater crocodiles, okay? So the environment is the pond. The agent of death is going to be your man-eating crocodiles, and you're the host, right? You're what it's going to attack. If you stay out of the pond, no problem, right? So you have to be in the right place at the right time the agent has to be in the environment in such a way to allow infection to occur, all right? Which brings me to this idea of chain of infection then. So you have these different reservoirs which may carry that agent, and I don't know how well you can see this, but the little magnifying glass has your agent there, be it a virus or a bacteria or a man-eating crocodile, whatever the case may be, and it resides in different places. You can see the human there, the rat, the wetland, Curiously enough, 
And then there's different modes of, of transmission. When we talk about disease transmission, I mentioned uh, West Nile virus, which is transmitted by insects. You can get nasty food poisoning through undercooked meat, for instance. Uh, close physical contact spreads things like sexually transmitted diseases and other infections. For COVID, it looks like the main mode of transmission is droplets via close contact. That's why y'all have masks on, right? Because if you can prevent the transmission of those droplets, you prevent the transmission of the virus. And then some viruses like measles, airborne transmission, they're so small that they're able to stay suspended in the air long periods of time, and you're able to get the infection simply through inhaling that contaminated air from the person who walked through hours ago with measles, okay? You're then going to have to have a mode of entry, a route of infection into the susceptible host. So different diseases are going to require different routes of entry. So with COVID, with influenza, with these pandemic diseases that we're talking about here, the mode of entry of all these is going to be the upper respiratory tract. So when you have a situation where you're exposed to the virus, if it's communicable, communicable by droplets or by aerosol, you're able to get that infection into the virus, into the place on your body where it can take root, okay? So things like masks that may prevent inhalation of those droplets, may prevent spread of those droplets, provide some defense of these infectious diseases, okay? So as we're working through this, you can realize that there's all sorts of opportunities for control. So if you think about something like plague, which is carried by fleas on rodents, you see our rat vector there. If you can control the rats or the prairie dogs and keep them away from humans, you're going to prevent spread of the plague, right? One of the things that prevented plague for a long time was not any special medicine, but rather the fact that we cleaned up our cities and there weren't rats running around every place. Not everybody had fleas in their house, transmitted by the rats carrying the plague. So we're able to attack these diseases at various stages as well. The other interesting thing I want to point out is in the bottom part of that figure, you'll see a wetland. So it turns out that many of these flus that we're looking at here, these influenza A's are transmitted through birds. So they're avian flu. Waterfowl are a common natural reservoir for influenza. Turns out that they shed the virus and that the virus can remain viable in wetlands for up to a few months. So you can have an infected duck land on a pond, not that I'm disparaging CCU's pond here, but let's say infected duck lands on CCU's pond, sheds virus, uninfected duck comes along, can pick up the virus, and you can continue the spread of the virus this way. So these different reservoirs are important places to control the chain of infection. The uh, mode of transmission is an important way to control chain of in infection. And then the, at the susceptible host, you have ways of controlling it as well, including immunization. So things like these flu, flu viruses have lots of different potential carriers, domestic birds, aquatic birds, the wetlands themselves, that allow them to hang around in the but why all of a sudden do these infections that are present, these viruses that are there, why do they jump to become a pandemic? Why doesn't it stay a local outbreak? Okay, so we had a sick duck in the pond and somebody swam in the pond and they got it and that's where it stayed. It usually requires a series of specialized events for a infectious disease to jump from endemic to epidemic and from epidemic then to pandemic. And there's a lot of different events that occur, okay? One thing we've noticed is since 1889, there's been an increase in, increase in urbanization and population density, right? You all are sitting more or less six feet apart here in the audience. That's on purpose. Right? We're trying to limit the density and affect mode of transmission that way. Right? But if you have people packed together in cities, especially living un under unsanitary conditions, disease is able to spread much more rapidly. 
where do some of these new viruses come from or these new uh, antigenic isotypes come from? It appears that in many cases, they have to do with some sort of ecosystem disturbance. And that's an incredibly broad category. But let's take coronaviruses, for instance. In the wild, there are literally thousands of different coronaviruses that are resident in bats. I was tempted to go back to my uh, chain of infection slide here and put wings on that rat, but I thought that might be too much. So you have all these bats in the wild that normally did not interact with humans. But as humans expand their range, encroach on ecosystems, cause fragmentation, other changes that disturb e existing ecosystems, you may have more interaction, you may have habitat fragmentation that causes these uh, reservoirs to move in new ways or causes humans to encounter them in new ways. And this is a recurring theme throughout the emergence of new infectious diseases. So diseases like Ebola, for instance, have a uh, an animal reservoir, and it appears that Ebola outbreaks are often the result of what's called the bushmeat trade. People go into the jungle, kill animals, bring them out, slaughter them, and sell them. Well, Ebola's transmission is transmitted through blood and body fluids. That slaughtering process results in infection. Somebody's got a cut on their hand, they're slaughtering a sick monkey or bat or whatever, and all of a sudden they have it, and then it moves through the population, okay? So these ecosystem disturbances in this sort of interaction of humans with potentially new disease reservoirs plays a role as well. When it comes to flu viruses, it turns out that you can have a situation where you have an avian virus that is in the, the bird population, and maybe you have a swine flu that's in the swine. If you get co-infection, as those viruses are working to infect the cells, sometimes you'll get two different viruses in the same cell and they're able to recombine and result in a brand new combination. So there are concerns anytime you see a new virus emerging, anytime you see these clashes of uh, populations of animals or animals and humans that have not necessarily come in contact before. Once you get an outbreak, the density in cities, once in a disease outbreak gets into a city, it tends to spread very rapidly. And then with the advent of global travel, you tend to have a much more rapid spread. So localized outbreak becomes a localized ap epidemic. Somebody goes somewhere and takes it with them. And if enough of those events occur, it can jump into a global pandemic. And I already discussed this a little bit, excuse me. Um, sometimes the pathogen changes, right? It may be that there was a recombination event between a swine flu and an avian flu or a mutation that occurred that all of a sudden makes this a little better than it ever was before with infecting. So the antigenic shifts that I described in flu pandemics make the virus better equipped to infect human populations, for instance. So what is it that changes, oops, what is it that changes in these genomes? What makes, or in these pathogens, what makes a good pathogen? Good is a relative term. One that infects people really well. Oftentimes, the most common traits are that they're viruses that have an RNA genome. And without going too deeply into the molecular biology of it, let's suffice to say that the genome is the instructions for how you make the virus. Your instructions are DNA. DNA is much more stable. And there are proofreading mechanisms in your cells that make sure your DNA says what it's supposed to. And if not, it fixes it. RNA does not have that same proofreading mechanism. So when a virus infects a cell and is making lots and lots of copies of itself, any errors that get incorporated don't get fixed. Now, sometimes those errors will result in changes that are deleterious to the virus, and it won't be very good anymore. But sometimes they can result in changes that make it more infective. 
or more virulent, more pathogenic. It's going to make you sicker. It's going to transmit from person to person easier. So many pathogenic viruses, or I'm sorry, pandemic potential viruses have an RNA genome. And we've just talked about the fact that many of them are going to have an animal reservoir, which is going to allow for what we call zoonotic transmission. So new virus in a hog because it got infected with a swine flu that it already had, and then the birds nesting in the rafters of the barn were infected with a new bird flu, and the hog got sick with both, and all of a sudden it's got this brand new virus, and then the person taking care of that hog who's in pro close proximity to it all the time picks up that virus, and all of a sudden it's that perfect virus that can then spread well in humans, and you have a new zoonotic transmission. So no, zoonotic means across species from animal type to animal type or animal type to human, right? And then the mode of transmission is important as well, okay? So the easier it is for the virus to jump from host to host, the more deadly it's going to be, the faster it's going to spread, okay? So I mentioned SARS and MERS, both of which are coronaviruses, and neither of them spreads that easily. And so when the new COVID-19 started popping up, the initial estimates were, yeah, coronaviruses don't spread very easy, so the R naught ought to be low. We had, uh-oh, lots of people have it. Uh-oh, lots more people have it. It's much more transmissible than we first suspected. And so the mode of transmission is critically important. Not only how easy it is to transmit, but is it transmitted by aerosol? Is it transmitted by droplets? Is it transmitted by a insect vector like West Nile? Bloodborne products only like Ebola? That sort of thing. So if it's something that transmits easily through droplets or aerosols, you're going to have a much more dangerous pathogen. So a new pathogen that jumps from animals that's got an RNA genome that's going to change quickly, that's easily transmissible from person to person, is going to give you a situation where a pandemic can occur, okay? There are organizations that are devoted to uh, what I'll call pandemic watch. They monitor reportable diseases all around the world and look for trends where endemic is jumping to outbreak, outbreak is jumping to epidemic, and their goal is to prevent those epidemics from jumping to pandemics. Typically, they're focused on influenza because as I showed you, historically, influenza has been the causative agent of global pandemics. So it's the one we typically watch for. And if you really wanna give yourself nightmares, you can go online and find all the really scary influences that have ident been identified worldwide that they worry could become the next global pandemic. Those websites are out there and they won't help you sleep at night. We don't know what's next, right? Coronavirus was not completely unexpected, but like I said, Previously, it had not transmitted well, but it, it's been shown to cause some very severe illnesses. Uh, SARS is terrible and MERS is worse. Well, now COVID-19 is sort of the median. It's not as deadly, but it transmits much easier. So many more people have been infected. This one was sort of a surprise, but there were those who were looking for it. That's why since SARS, since MERS, there's been much more research funding available for looking at coronaviruses because of their pandemic potential, right? They check the boxes of being an RNA virus that lives in an animal reservoir that has potential zoonotic transmission, okay? Um, there are some other really scary viruses out there. I mentioned measles. Measles is a paramyxovirus. It's terribly transmissible. There are some other paramyxoviruses out there that cause severe disease. There's one called Nipah and Hendra. So these, again, are RNA viruses that exist in animal reservoirs that have jumped to humans and caused terrible disease. So far, thankfully, all very low transmitter. Does that make sense? So no pandemic from these guys yet, hopefully never. And then the one that everybody is terrified of is disease X. Disease X represents 
a virus that we've never encountered, that we know nothing about, that all of a sudden checks all these or potentially other boxes, causes severe illness, is easily spread, and changes rapidly. Okay? We don't know what disease X is, but it's one we watch for. That's why public health authorities are continuously monitoring for these jumps from endemic to epidemic to pandemic, right? Because if possible, we wanna cut off global pandemics where we can, halt them on our tracks and save human lives that way. So you may or may not have noticed that at the bottom of each of my slides, I have text or email questions to sseeventq at gmail.com. We have that so that if you're online right now and would like to have a, a, ask a question, we're gonna have a few minutes of live Q&A now. And what we can do is you can simply text your question to that address or you can email to that address. We also have a live audience here so we can alternate back and forth between in-person questions and a few online questions. I have one of my faculty here who's going to assist with looking at those questions. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, please either text it in, or if you're here in person, please raise your hand. I'd love to answer questions because I think that may be as much or more beneficial than what I've told you here today. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Oh, could you hold one second to be on the microphone? Do you think that COVID-19 will migrate like the flu and come back seasonally? Do I think that COVID-19 will become a seasonal infection? I think it's entirely possible. One of the really concerning developments with COVID-19 is studies that are already showing within a few weeks, some individuals no longer show antibodies to the virus. So they've done studies showing that people that absolutely were infected, they tested positive multiple times within four months and in some cases much less, no longer have any circulating antibodies. We don't know what that means for future infection rates. We also know that there have been a few documented cases of reinfection. Someone who had the disease, apparently cleared it, and has had and the disease infection, and they've become reinfected. Now, there's a lot we don't know yet. In some cases, it could be that there was uh, inactive reservoir of virus somewhere in their body and it reemerged when they're immune compromised. So you have diseases like um, varicella zoster that causes chicken pox. Later in life, it goes latent. And then later in life, if you're immune compromised, you may get a disease called shingles. Same virus, never left your body. I don't think that's the case with coronavirus, but we just don't know enough yet. So the fact that there appears to be the potential for reinfection and the fact that some people do not seem to be mounting an, a robust immune response. My supposition is that coronavirus is, or COVID-19 specifically is here to stay and it may just become a version of the seasonal flu just like influenza right now. My hope is that there are new therapies that are emerging. Not only are there lots of vaccines in development but there are new therapies that are emerging that have greatly increased the survival there's one that's been reported, reported to have 100% survival of hospitalized patients, which would be wonderful. If we could turn it into a nasty infection instead of a deadly disease, that's a huge step in the right direction. I don't know if it'll be seasonal because many people believe that, oh, and I will include myself in this erroneous belief, uh, I thought once summer hit, hot weather, people are outside more, infection rates would drop. That certainly wasn't the case in many areas. So I don't know if it'll be seasonal or if it'll just become endemic. So great question, thank you. Other questions? Dr. Furness, do we have any online questions? I have a question. Um, so there's a lot of information out there right now and it's easy to ask the expert when we have him standing in the room what would be good sources for us to look at? I mean, you go on social media and there's all sorts of information, all sorts of numbers. And I think 
that's kind of what a big concern is right now is what numbers do you trust? What numbers do you not trust? Who do you believe? Who do you not believe? Is there anybody else that I can? Social media should never be your source for scientific data. You should rely on as much as possible peer reviewed sources. Now, much of that data is difficult to interpret and difficult to parse, right? But most institutions like the National Institutes of Health, the National Library of Medicine, the Centers for Disease Control, the World Health Organization, John Hopkins, those are going to rely on some validated information. That's what I mean by peer review. In the scientific community, when you, uh, thank you, Jeremy, when you are looking to popularize your results, you have other experts in the field look at it and validate it before it goes out there. So I would caution you to look at quote unquote reputable sources. Okay. Some of it can be a little, little tough to dig through, but many uh, health agencies, including our own Colorado Department of Public Health, do an excellent job of presenting information in layman's terms that's easily understandable. I always caution people about social media. A lot of times the circle that you already hold beliefs in is the circle that you've surrounded yourself in social media. So the archaic term is you're in an echo chamber you're only hearing back what you're putting out there and, and that's a never a good way to, believe, to be. As an academic institution, we believe in teaching you to think for yourselves and think broadly. Don't just listen to what others have to say. If you question anything that I said tonight, research it, reach out to me, email me, let me know, make an appointment, come by my office. I'm happy to discuss. So we had one text in question. It says, was swine flu more or less transmissible than COVID-19? And I think my add on to that would be, what about regular influenza, like the everyday flu that we have? I don't have that data ready to hand in my mind. Um, and I think one of the reasons I don't know that is there's still a lot of debate about just how tra transmissible COVID-19 is. So I've seen wildly varying estimates for the r naught, and it seems to be changing, which is something that happens with influenza virus as well. So the 1918 pandemic, for instance, the virus came in three waves. An early wave, winter in 1918, a devastating wave, fall 1918, and then winter, spring of 1919. And what they observed is that over time, the virus did what they call reversion to the mean. And by that, I mean, normally, the mean effect of a influenza infection is some people get a little sick, some people get really sick, some people die, okay? But not too many die. Mortality rates are relatively low. The 1918 virus had this enormous spike in mortality rates, especially in that second wave in the fall, but over time, the virus seemed to attenuate itself. It seemed to revert to the mean. This is very common in pathogens. Because if you think about it, if you're a pathogen, your only way to stay around is to have a good selection of hosts that you can survive in. If you kill off all your hosts, you're out of luck. So you want to make people sick enough to keep you going and spread you around, but you don't want to kill them off. And so I suspect that the coronavirus is already reverting to the mean a little bit and that we may see more of that. Could be that we understand it better, we have better treatments, better monitoring, people are more aware that they need to get treated, that sort of thing. So there's a balance there. As far as how it relates to influenza, I just don't have that data ready to hand. It feels a little less transmissible but I think it appears much more transmissible because nobody's immune, right? The common flu comes around and a lot of people have seen it before or gotten the flu shot and it happened to be a year where we hit the bullseye with the flu shot and it contained the right virus. So 
That's my non-answer answer. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Do you have another one? Okay, please. Okay, so it says that I heard the current contenders for a likely coronavirus vaccine are RNA vaccines. It says, could you talk about what an RNA vaccine is and how it is different from the current vaccine types that we have? Um, that says also, why do these likely COVID vaccines have to be kept at very low temperatures? So without doing an entire lecture on vaccines, what you want to do with a vaccine is introduce the markers of the pathogen into your body in such a way that your body recognizes it as being bad, got to fight it off, and that it remembers it later so that if it ever sees the live virus, it knows to go crazy and kill it off before it can infect you and make you sick. What typical vaccines are composed of now is either proteins, portions of the virus, or in some cases, what's called an attenuated virus. So they took the vi actual virus and they damaged it in such a way that it still looks like the virus, but it can't replicate in your cells, it can't make you sick, it can't cause disease. Okay, that's uh, a component uh, vaccine, an attenuated vaccine, and then they have things called killed vaccines. So Salk's first polio vaccine, he grew three different types of virus, treated them with formaldehyde to kill them, and then injected them into people. Okay, so that killed virus. The RNA vaccines are a new thing. We have not been using them previously. The idea is that RNA is the instructions to make the pieces of the virus. I talked about it having an RNA genome. So what you can do, the theory is that if you inject the instructions to make those surface markers from the virus, the stuff that your body needs to see to say, oh, virus, gotta get it. If you just inject the instructions, there's no chance of infection, no chance of consequences. Your cells are full of different types of RNAs right now, but it will elicit an immune response such that your body recognizes any subsequent infections. So that's new technology to the field of vaccines. And so it's, uh, it has to do with we haven't tried it before. We're very hopeful if this works well, it may revolutionize the speed at which we can develop vaccines to new pathogens. Okay. And as far as keeping them cold, if you think about what I just described, if you have pieces of a virus, you wanna be sure that it's stable so that when it goes into your body, your body is able to recognize that it's not broken down. Right? That's why vaccines may have preservatives or be kept cold or that sort of thing. Okay. One more? Yeah, I have one more. Um, kind of on that same thread. So the question was, again, the purpose of the vaccine is to introduce a little bit of the virus into your body so your body can fight off the disease next time. How does the vaccine work if you've already been infected with the disease? If you've already had the disease, the, infect, uh, the inoculation won't do you any good because your body has already seen the virus and is thus already aware that it doesn't belong and it should fight it off. So it won't do you any harm, but at the same time, it won't do you any good, right? So your body will mount an immune response. And I guess that leads to another question. Sometimes when people get a vaccination, they may feel a little ill, okay? You did not get the flu from your flu shot. When you get the flu, the symptoms that you have, the fever, the body aches, all those things, those are things that your own body does to you to help prevent the virus growing, okay? It's your own immune system saying, hey, we gotta do everything we can to keep this thing from growing. Well, when you get a, a, a vaccination, you're priming your immune system. You're starting up that process. So you're not infected. You didn't get the flu from your flu shot. There's no live virus in the flu vaccine. Rather, your body saw just enough of it to say, this is what is going to happen if we actually get this disease. We're going to practice right now so that we know next time. So you can't get the disease from the vaccination because there is no infectious particles in the vaccination. 
if that makes sense. All right, we're all done. Dr. Sweden, thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. I hope that you're more informed and edified by this. Like I said, feel free to reach out to me. You can continue to email questions to this email address, and I'll check them. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Parker, and thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great evening.